Now, I look to women's officer at the union, Larissa Kober, Mansfield College, to conclude the case for proposition. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving me the immense opportunity to speak in this historic chamber. As a law student from Mansfield College, I find myself arguing against Helen Mountfield QC, who is not only an admiral bar barrister, but also my principal. <laughs> and as much as I hope that this house will make the sensible decision of finding in favor of this motion tonight, my next formal hall will probably be an awkward one. <laughs> Today's opposition is trying to make you believe that our side does not wish to advance social justice at all, that we are simply dismissing the opportunity to address these issues in the courtroom and making us seem like villains. They have relied on landmark cases that evidence change in, changes in our society. I by no means wish to belittle these successes. After all, this country has the privilege of having a common law system where judges will inevitably exercise a lawmaking function. However, the opposition simply failed to grasp what the motion tonight is really about. It is about finding the most able, most effective, and most legitimate means and battleground for advancing social justice. And to do so, I'm asking you all to take a few steps back and think about what social justice means to you. It will not mean the same thing to you, to you, to the side of proposition, to the side of opposition, or to Mr. President, really. <laughs> Of course will the opposition tell you that courts should be the place to advance social justice. But let me rephrase. They are arguing that the courts should be the forum for advancing their vision of social justice, the one that they were instructed to defend throughout their brilliant careers. But this view is just so narrow. Social justice deserves a bigger platform. My question to you is, where should we fight the battles affecting our fundamental rights, the core of our society? My answer is that the battleground should not be a closed courtroom, but a forum where collective decision-making and thinking is possible. My, no, thank you. My first point is institutional incapability. Throughout judicial history, the courts have admitted at times that they were incompetent to adjudicate on certain social justice reforms. Let me tell you about the absolutely revolting ordeal that the Bellinger couple had to go through in 2003. Mrs. Bellinger, a trans woman, wanted a court to recognize her union. However, the Marital Causes Act 1973 stated that marriage could only occur between a female and a male. Thus, the House of Lords should have, and we would have all appreciated it to have recognized that union, as the law was simply discriminatory but it dismissed the appeal and merely issued a declaration of incompatibility, which only serves an advisory function in our system. The court was granted a forum for social justice in that case, but here it did not advance Mr. Bell Mrs. Bellinger's cause. On the contrary, it put a virulent halt to her pursuit of being recognized as a woman at law, as a wife at law, and it regressed the status of, trans of the entire trans community. By allowing the court to be a battleground for social justice, granted, advances will be made, changes will be made, but so many individuals have been harmed in the past, regressing social justice in the process. And to defend the proposition's case tonight, I think that we need to consider the role that the courts play in the living organism that is our constitution. When we look at the legislative or the executive, I like to think that it is the head, the ones that elaborate laws and the values of our society, using the advice of, our, of the constituencies and the community at, at large. Courts, on the other hand, are the guardians of that constitution. They are the controlling function, filtering toxic substances out of our bodies. In a way, it is our constitution's liver. And let me ask you something. Would you really want your liver to be making the most important decisions in your life? Especially after one too many nights of Bridge or Park End? <laughs> Thank you. Now, if not the courtroom, which organ is the best place to successfully advance social justice? Well, let's look at history. How will the most important advancements affected in the recent years? The Human Rights Act 1998, incorporating the European Court, uh, Convention of Human Rights into UK law. The Equality Act 2010, bringing together more than 100 separate pieces of legislation in an effort to advance equal opportunity for all. 
the Sex Discrimination Act 1975, making discrimination on the basis of sex in education, employment, and provision of services illegal. The list can go on and on and on, but what is the common denominator? They were all acts of parliament. Only parliament, our nation's sovereign body, has the power to spearhead such wide reforms. One case will only address the tip of the iceberg. It is all that the courts are allowed to do. So to truly activate change, dozens and dozens and dozens of judgments would be made and success is, isn't even guaranteed. Whereas one act of parliament could solve it all. No, thank you. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot overlook one of the biggest flaws of our lawmaking judiciary. Courtrooms suffer from an incurable lack of le democratic legitimacy. If you look at our Supreme Court, for example, it is predominantly composed of old, white, Augsburg men. Apologies, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> Decision advancing human rights are admirable. So why should you care, and as the opposition might, has raised tonight, that the democratic process is somewhat neglected in pursuit of safeguarding social justice? Well, let me ask you one question. How can you be okay with having a narrow, unelected elite make decisions which will affect masses? The greatest reforms are best crystallized through the legislative process, but we cannot forget that social justice is most often driven by our communities. Use an example that is close to home, Switzerland, on September 26th of this year, finally legalized gay marriage. And this was made through a direct referendum. The will of the people was the catalyst of such change. We saw our small nation advance in unison and evolve towards a more equal future. Social justice is about society. Point. So, no thank you. So it is only natural to place that battleground within society. Now, as I'm slowly closing the case for proposition tonight, I would like to return to the arguments that my dear colleagues made tonight. It is not the courtroom's role to bring about large fundamental changes in society. They even regress that evolution sometimes. They lack democratic legitimacy, so necessary to affect change amongst our people. And furthermore, the greatest changes were sim purely and simply not made in the courtrooms. They were protected by the sovereign parliament, but most importantly made by our heads, our hearts, our souls, our society. This is why tonight, I implore you to find in favor of this motion. I implore you to stand up and walk out through the right door tonight, <laughs> to the right door tonight. I implore you to put the advancement of social justice back in the hands of democracy, back in the hands of sovereign parliament and ultimately our communities. If we want to achieve true and legitimate societal change, we ought not to look towards our courtrooms. The greatest changes were driven by uproar on the streets, debated and shaped in classrooms and debating chambers like these. I mean, why are we all standing tonight debating this motion? And how can the courtroom possibly be the best forum for this? Thank you.